Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Koken. We're in Chapter 8, Estimating with Confidence. And in Section 8.1, we're going to be looking at the basics about confidence intervals. In Sections 2 and 3, we're going to be looking at confidence intervals for proportions and means, respectively. The objectives of this section are to determine the point estimate and margin of error from a confidence interval, interpret a confidence interval in context, interpret a confidence level in context, Describe how the sample size and confidence level affect the width of a confidence interval. And explain how practical issues like non-response, under coverage, and response bias can affect the interpretation of a confidence interval. Imagine that we come up with a number, and that number we're going to call our mystery number. We put that at the center of a normal distribution, so it's the mean of the normal distribution, and the normal distribution has a standard deviation of 20. Then from that normal distribution, we take a sample of 16 numbers. Then we take the mean of the sample of size 16. So when we took the mean of the sample of size 16, the result that we ended up, the mean, is 240.79. And what our job is, to, is to try to determine what a range of plausible values is for our mystery number. What's What's a good estimate of our mystery number? Now we could estimate exactly 240.79, but we know that that's not really likely for it to be exactly our mystery number. When it comes from a, a mean of size 16 from a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 20. So think about that, and we're gonna come back to that in a minute. If we were trying to estimate a population parameter, such as the population mean, what number might we use to estimate that? Well, typically we would use a sample mean. And if we were trying to estimate a population proportion, we would probably use a sample proportion. So in both cases, we would be using something that we call a point estimate to estimate the parameter of interest. Now we know that the unbiased estimator, the ideal point estimator, will have low bias or no bias and low variability. But we have variability, sampling variability, and every time we take a sample, we're going to get a different point estimate. So just a reminder of what point estimator is. It's the statistic that we're using to estimate the population parameter and the point estimate is the actual value of that statistic, so the actual proportion or the actual mean that we're using to estimate our population parameter. Now let's go back to that idea of the mystery number. We know that we came up with a mean of our sample of size 16 of 240.79. I want you to consider how likely is it that our mystery number is exactly 240.79? Well, we know the probability is close to zero, that we were going to guess it exactly when we have a standard deviation of 20. So what we want to think about is how would the sample mean X bar vary if we took many simple random samples of size 16? We know we have sampling variability. So when we take samples of size 16 from our population with a standard deviation of 20, we're going to get different sample values each time, different sample means, because remember, we're taking a sample of size 16, finding the mean. We end up with what we learned about in Chapter 7, which is our sampling distribution that has the same center as the population, but has a narrower or smaller standard deviation because it is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of our sample size. Our parent population that we're taking our samples of size 16 from is normally distributed. So we know every time we take a sample, the sample is also going to be normally distributed and the sampling distribution, even though our sample size is only 16, is also going to be normally distributed with a mean that is the same as our mystery mean and a standard deviation of five. We remember from chapter two that the empirical rule, also known as the 68-95-99.7 rule, tells us that in 95% of all samples of size 16, X bar, or the sample mean, 
our point estimate will be within 10 or two standard deviations of the center of our distribution, of the mean of our distribution. So that's two standard deviations on the left, two standard deviations on the right. Because our standard deviation is five, that's a plus or minus 10 units from our mean, our mystery mean. And if our X bar is, is within 10 points of our center, then that means that it's within 10 points that the center, the population center is within 10 points of our sample mean. So the way that we look at this is we say this 95%, again, starting at the middle, working our way outwards, two standard deviations on either side, is going to somehow, somewhere, include or capture our mystery number, the center of our population value, in 95% of all of the samples that we take of the same size, of size 16. So if we estimate that our population mean lies somewhere between the interval of 230.79, which is 240.79 minus 10, to 250.79, which is 240.79 plus 10, that is our interval, that is our confidence interval where we are 95% confident, meaning that this method will create an interval from a point estimate that 95% of the time is actually going to include our population mean. This idea that we're talking about of a confidence interval is always going to start out with our point estimate and then it's going to be plus or minus this margin of error. That margin of error is part of our estimate. It's not the only the point estimate that is our estimate. It's the entire range of plausible values, the entire confidence interval. So a C percent confidence interval gives a range or an interval of plausible values for the estimate of our population parameter. And the interval we calculate from the data using our point estimate that we get from the sample plus or minus the margin of error that is driven by the confidence level. So the confidence level C gives the overall success rate of that method for calculating a confidence interval. Success rate means how many times out of 100 would such a method give us or yield an interval that actually contains or captures the true population parameter. Remember what the confidence level represents. It is the overall capture rate or success rate if we use the same method of sampling many, many times. Even though we're going to have sampling variability, even though every single point estimate is going to be different, we know that when we use this method of the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error to create an interval for each one of the samples, the percent C, the confidence level, is going to give us the percent of intervals that will actually contain the population mean the actual value that we're trying to estimate. So 95% of the intervals capture or include the unknown mean, and this is why we're estimating, of the population. This graphic is a beautiful one because it actually shows you a bunch of different possible intervals. The red dots are the point estimates and the green on either side represents the plus or minus of the margin of error. You can see that there's one interval in blue that misses, the interval does not include, does not intersect with, does not capture or contain the actual mean of the population and or of the uh, sampling distribution for that matter because it's the same center, same mean. It does not capture it and all the other ones do. So this is a representative of that 5% that doesn't capture the true population value and the 95% of values that of uh, intervals that do capture the population value. So these are kind of templates that you're going to be using to give the interpretation in context of a confidence interval. We're going to say we are whatever percent confident that the interval from lower boundary to upper boundary 
captures the actual value or the true value or the population value of, and then you give the population parameter and the population of interest, okay? When we want to interpret the confidence level, we're going to write it as if we take many samples of the same size from this population, about whatever percent, 95% of them, if it's a 95% confidence level, will result in an interval that captures the actual parameter value. So we're going to use those kind of as a template. And in our four-step process, we'll be doing a lot of we are whatever percent confident. The confidence level tells us how likely it is that the method we're using will produce an interval that captures the population parameter if we use it many times. So what percent of our intervals will actually contain the population parameter? The confidence level does not tell us the chance that a particular confidence interval captures the population parameter. It's going to tell us the overall rate, the capture rate if we take many, many samples. So the confidence interval is going to give us a set of plausible values or a range of plausible values for our estimate of the population parameter. So why should we settle for 95% confidence? The format of our 95% or our, our confidence interval at any percent of confidence is always going to be that point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. And the margin of error is going to be created by the product of the critical value, which we're going to talk about in class, and the standard deviation of the statistic. Because we can't use the standard deviation of the population. We don't know it. That's what we're, tr when we're trying to estimate the center of our population. And that means that we definitely don't know the standard deviation of our population. So this is going to be the generic format of the confidence interval. When we create the confidence interval, we're going to start out with that point estimate, the sample statistic, plus or minus the critical value, times the standard deviation of the statistic, which remember we're going to call the standard error. The confidence level is going to dictate to us what the critical value is. And if we want more confidence, larger confidence, it's going to mean a larger critical value so that we can have a wider interval. And the standard deviation of the statistic, remember the formula for the standard deviations, it's going to depend on the sample size n. A couple things to remember when we're constructing and interpreting confidence intervals. Number one, our method of calculation assumes that the data comes from a simple random sample. Randomness is the absolute must condition for when we're creating these confidence intervals. Without randomness, we really can't say that our estimate is going to represent, be a good representative of our population value. And the margin of error that we create, remember, is based on the confidence level, which dictates our our critical value and the standard error or the standard deviation of the statistic. That means it does not cover errors that were done with bad sampling, such as convenient samples or voluntary samples. So it does not cover those types of errors, errors in random assignment, or anything else that introduces bias into the process of collecting data. The margin of error is strictly about the range of values, creating a range of values dictated again by our confidence level. Okay, our basics section is over. And in this section, we learned how to determine the point estimate, which is halfway between our uh, upper and low, lower and upper boundaries of the confidence interval. We were able to calculate a margin of error and interpret a confidence interval in context, interpret a confidence level in context. We're going to use those templates. Describe how the sample size and confidence level affect the length of a confidence interval or the width of a confidence interval. And explain how issues like non-response, undercoverage, and response bias do not have anything to do with the margin of error. They're a problem with the data. And if we have that kind of bad data to start with, we really need to start over and get good data before we even try to create a confidence interval. 
That's it for section one. I'll see you back for section two.